beautiful, sunny, bright day. Well, in spite of the cheery uh, feeling of the morning, I would like to uh, present a question to the assembly. How can we live with the truth of loss? when the Buddha uh, was still living in the palace and had a very full life, a very successful life. Uh, it's said that he left and he came across three sites. Uh, first was to encounter someone who was very old and then encountered someone who was sick and then encountered uh, someone who had passed away. And this threw him into a great conundrum. Even though his life was very full, very successful in all of the ways that um, a life could be successful at the time and place uh, where he lived. Uh, old age, sickness, and death undermine that success. It said that there was a fourth sight that the Buddha saw a spiritual seeker, a renunciate, who was walking calmly through this world of old age, sickness, and death. And that's what set the Buddha out on his great journey uh, to discover the tree of awakening and to become the Buddha of this world. And so as we come around to this time uh, each year, of the celebration of the Buddha's enlightenment, of course there's something that is so joyous about, um, about this. You know? The Buddha woke up. And in the Buddha's waking up, we also woke up. Our deep heart has that luminosity of the Buddha's awakening. It's not hindered by space or time, by culture, by language, by anything. And it's also important that we start at this question. How can we live with the truth of loss? And not just survive. You know, I don't mean live here like, how can we just put up with loss? How can we survive? How can we keep going in our life with loss? But how do we really live? How do we live fully knowing that things are impermanent? Knowing that something which is very important and significant to me right in this moment, um, it will change and shift in the next. And that, essentially, I can't own anything. I can't even own my own life. I think this is one of the reasons it's so important to come back to the Buddha's awakening in a very direct way each year, is to encounter this uh, deep, unsettling truth about what it means to be alive. And there's many ways that we might deal with this uh, difficult truth. But I want to point out that the, one of the common ways, which is to deny the significance of a human life, is very common spiritually to sort of undermine the importance of a human life, to place everything on a hereafter or, um, or some other realm and to downgrade this realm as being uh, not, not important. That's one of the strategies to deal with loss. But this is not what the Buddha did. In fact, uh, the teachings that the Buddha presented to us, present to us, do not deny a human life, but radically affirm the importance of a human life. That in this 
realm of loss, in this realm of old age, sickness, and death. What the Buddhas of, and Bodhisattvas of other realms refer to our realm as the realm of suffering, the world of suffering because of this loss. That our life here in this world of suffering is vitally important, that we can uh, live fully, not just survive, not just get by, but truly flourish. And so that's the side of the Buddha's awakening, which is a celebration. We have to encounter this difficult question. We have to encounter our own deep anxiousness about our life, our own suffering, our own um, instability, uh, moment to moment, grasping after something that will try to uh, keep it together. Because that's where the journey begins. If we don't recognize that, the no uh, true journey of awakening uh, can take place. And so after the Buddha left the palace, uh, left his life of success, left his life uh, that looked very stable in all of the ways that a life could look stable, and flourishing at that time uh, in place. Um, he, he kept this question close to him. And even though he went to study with uh, two of the most important spiritual teachers of his uh, age and place and fully mastered their teachings to the extent that they asked him to become their successors or to, to share um, in the teaching of their communities, the Buddha said, thank you very much for your teaching. I've learned so much, me paraphrasing, <laughs> I've learned so much, but this doesn't actually address this fundamental question. It's great, actually. He went from all of the kind of fulfillment of a worldly life to all of the fulfillment of a spiritual life. And still, it didn't satisfy this, uh, this central question. And the Buddha tried to crush everything about this life, to completely deny the human life, and took up an ascetic practice. So we have the total success in these two realms, and then we have the total um, uh, leaving of the world, leaving aside all things of the world, including things like eating and bathing. He just lived in the woods, um, very close to death from malnourishment. And why he lied there on the ground and he just wouldn't die. Some of the sutras tell us that the, that the uh, gods breathed life into him because they knew how important he was and they didn't want him to die. And he just laid there kind of waiting for it all to end and they breathed life into him. They wouldn't let him go. And so he gave up the ascetic life. He washed his body. He received nourishment. But still this question, you know. Sometimes in the story, when he gives up the ascetic practice, it feels like, oh, okay, everything's okay now. You know? But it wasn't okay. That same question still burned in his mind. It hadn't changed at all. And he goes to look for the place in which this question could really be addressed. He hasn't found the place where it can be addressed. He's done many things, but he hasn't found that pivot point. He hasn't found the place from which this question emerges. And so he continues on his journey to find the Tree of Awakening. Now there are many legends, many stories um, concerning that journey. But this morning, I'd like to just point out two. And they both, um, they both point to, or they both talk about the, the kind of finale, right? which is what Jodoe is about. The, Jodoe uh, means the assembly of attaining to the way. So December 8th uh, is that date in uh, Japanese Buddhism and in um, lineages that come from 
um, from Japanese schools. Uh, so that'll be this Wednesday. So this week we always celebrate the Buddha's awakening or the Buddha's attaining to the way, which is the climax of, um, of this story. I don't know if that's the right word, but it's the, um, it's the great uh, resolution of this uh, question and the birth of a Buddha. Uh, so there's two legends I'd like to talk about this morning. The first one is the one that is the most common in Japan in general and particularly within the Zen schools. And that is that the Buddha sat there under the tree without moving at all. Sometimes we say for many years. Sometimes it will be seven years under the tree. Sometimes it will be one week. We practice this uh, week of a meditation um, a retreat for one week. So that's a little easier than the seven years version. So we can do that every year. The other one's a little hard. Um, so uh, he, he sits there without... Um, without any stirring at all. And then on the night, the seventh night, uh, early in the morning, there is a morning star. And the Buddha sees the morning star and makes the great proclamation, what's known as his first lion's roar. That I, the great earth and all beings, attain to the way at the same time. You can, can feel that legend, maybe some picture that arises in your, you know, your own um, eye of, of seeing things, your own internal eye, a Buddha there under uh, the tree of awakening facing the east. In total stillness, there is this one point of light. You know, if you see a, a, a morning star, it's quite amazing. You know, where there's this just maybe slight paleness that's coming into the sky. And then there's this bright star. And one thing, when you see that star, you're aware of the fleetingness of the light. You know, because the day is coming. The dawn is upon you. Right? But, but, but it's still burning there. And for the Buddha to see this star, and for that star to not just be his perception, right, but for it to crack open his spirit, his mind, and so that he knew that that one point of light was about all beings, was about the great earth, and about the way. They're beautiful. The second legend um, involves Mara, the deceiver, as he's sometimes called, who follows the Buddha around and tries to keep him from waking up. He's the personification of delusion. Um, in some stories, he shows up quite like evil, but um, in a traditional way, he's not evil. He's just the god of this world. He's the worldly God. He's the, the one that says, yeah, your life should be fulfilling. Look, you have a palace, you have wealth, you have a wonderful family, you have all of these things. You should be satisfied with it. You should be satisfied with it. So not necessarily a bad guy all the time, but he doesn't like being taken off of the center. Right? So as the Buddha draws closer to the to the Bodhi tree, um, Mara gets nervous because he knows this center of the wheel is a place where he can be dethroned, where his value system of grasping after satisfaction um, may be overturned. And so he launches these attacks on the Buddha. And if you read in the sutras, they're quite, they're quite colorful. And Mara is sending heaps of of hot ash on the Buddha. And as it comes, as the Buddha is sitting and just uh, turns into incense powder or raining um, blades down upon the Buddha and they turn into flowers as they come close. There's many beautiful uh, images there. But after all of these different ways that Mara tries to unseat the Buddha from underneath the tree and the Buddha doesn't, 
doesn't um, interact with him at all. He's already included. The Buddha hasn't been shedding Mara out at all. So Mara's attack can't have any effect. Those of you who are martial artists, maybe sometimes you've seen, I, I, I once had the um, uh, uh, pleasure to see um, a uh, Tai Chi, really amazing Tai Chi um, master um, do a demonstration kind of like a, I know it's not a fight, what do you call it, a little tournament or something? Like people go in the ring, they kind of go at it with uh, somebody who was more of like a, a kicker and um, hitter type. And this Tai Chi teacher just went, Voop, and he got really close to the other um, a fighter. And whenever the fighter would move, the Tai Chi teacher was just like right there. It was just like stuck to him kind of. And there was no, there ended up being no kind of um, um, altercation because the Tai Chi teacher was just, was just like totally one with this other person. It was really beautiful, um, beautiful to watch. I know some of you practice Aikido, you can see that same kind of thing arise in an Aikido uh, encounter. So this is how the Buddha is here under the tree. There's no gap between the Buddha and Mara, so the attacks can't do anything. There's no outside place from which Mara uh, can attack. But finally, Mara, as the personification of doubt, comes to the Buddha and says, this isn't your seat. Just think about that attack. That's like the... That's like the most hardcore attack. Like all the ashes and blades and all those things aren't, you know, those are hard, right? You know, uh, but the Buddha just... Phew. See how that question lurks in your own mind. This isn't your seat. This isn't your seat. The essential doubt that keeps that world going where we try to grasp after things knowing that we will lose them and then can't appreciate their real aliveness when Mara says this is not your seat the Buddha says nothing he simply takes his right hand and touches the earth. This is known as the earth witness mudra. Now in some of the legends, there is uh, embodiment of the great mother earth that is present. And she speaks to Mara. In other forms of the legend, all of the things of the earth sing in the affirmation of this being the Buddha seat. the vast interconnected world you know, is all present there. And the Buddha does not defend himself at all. He doesn't explain, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm the Buddha. I found this tree. I'm here. I've been meditating really hard. This is my place. I've been doing all these things to make it my place. Right? He would lose in a second if that was his mind. He says... Whose seat is this not? At the center of things. Where all are present. Even Mara is present. And so I bring up these two images this morning because in some ways they're very different. One is this single luminous light in which all things are included like the pivot of a wheel the hub of a wheel just that one brightness nothing is left out all is included and that's one side of the way we practice particularly it kind of emphasizes a concentration or a samadhi in which Oh, we sit meditation and things become clear. There's another side of practice in which all things are included, but they're very present. 
all the vast interconnectedness is about presence. Not just transparency, but the, the actuality of the earth, the physical earth and the spiritual earth. And even of Mara, of all of our karma, of all of the interconnected complexity of a human life. It's not about just getting to the place where everything is really clear like a morning star, even though everything's included in that. It's included in that just in its transparency. This practice is also about the <laughs> unbelievable complexity, which we can't grasp. And so the presence of things can be really encountered. See, if you could grasp it all, you wouldn't presence with any of it. We can see that in our consciousness all the time. We say, oh, this is a lawn. We can grasp it. We know what it is. We have a name for it. It's a lawn. And then we don't even bother to notice there's no such thing as a lawn. You know, there's like when we were spreading seeds for the lawn this summer, there was like 10 kinds of seeds in there. Right? And I was reading about it. Some of them will grow and die right away, and the other ones won't grow until a little bit later. And that's how they make the seed mixture. It's not just one thing. It's this dynamic process you know, that's going on. And we're not even talking about the bugs and the worms and all of the other stuff that's down there and the fingernail clippings that someone left out there while they were clipping their fingers on the rock. I wouldn't say who that was, but um, it's all there, right? But as soon as we could grasp it, our presence would be lost because now we live in the name. What's oh, the lawn? But the Buddha invites us to something else that there is a true presence in ungraspability, which is just the opposite of the, um, the palace, where he could know what success was, he could know what was a good life. So these two images, they are um, helpful to each other. So I just invite you this um, year, this week of the Buddha's awakening, to hold those two uh, images in your mind, those two parts of the legend. And um, there are a lot of these legends you can read in. If you have any books about Buddhism, or you go on the internet, there's lots and lots of this um, about the story. And that's one of the things that's so wonderful about being part of a tradition that has really robust myth, is that you can go and you can interact with different versions of the story, or just a retelling of the story again and again, and it starts to live in you uh, in different ways. There's many beautiful um, images and pictures too, um, which come from that, um, that world of myth. And so as you, as you let those images, um, let those uh, stories um, uh, roll around in your mind and in your heart, um, this week uh, I'd invite you to also join in uh, with the, the practice that will be happening over this week. For some of you that will mean being here in the, the um, meditation intensive um, full time. Um, but you're also welcome to come in the mornings and the evenings. There's um, open times where you can come and uh, meditate um, uh, during this week. You could come for the whole week. You could come just one time. Um, also, just uh, also at home to um, honor this week in a special way, holding these uh, images of the Buddha's awakening and bringing them to your altar or to your lawn uh, and simply um, appreciating deeply what this week is about um, in the, the great turning of the wheel uh, of Buddhism. Uh, next week, we will close the practice term uh, with a formal question and answer, uh, question response uh, uh, ritual, which is known as uh, Shosan, which will bring this inaugural uh, practice term. We've had many practice terms, but this is the one at the establishment of the abbotship, which means I get to wear a different colored robe. So, ho, 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 ho. let's see how that changes things. Um, uh, and it's, uh, um, it's very important, you know, for us as a community and for the temple to um, have laid down the roots that we have laid down and to be able to come to this um, year of the Buddha's awakening 
uh, celebration, uh, having laid the roots for 20 years to be able to come back to something and to know something about its truth. It's not just the beginning. It's a celebration of something that we have turned together for um, for many years now. And for the, some of you have been here for that whole time, some for part of that time, some today might just be your first day. But that's uh, what the Buddha also said. He said, I did not invent this way. I woke up to an ancient way. It wasn't the Buddha that invented the Buddha way. It's that the Buddha Shakyamuni woke up to the way of the enlightened one of the awakened one, which is not bound in time. It's like a wheel that turns. And we, as we join that wheel, we push. And then we are also carried along. And then it becomes harder to tell, am I pushing or am I being carried? You know? Like on the, if you're a kid on the merry-go-rounds before they started uh, deciding they were too dangerous on the playgrounds, you know, there's no spin around and you push it and you push it and then pretty soon it will start pulling you, you know, you have to jump on. Um, this is this is how uh, um, uh, the tradition is flowing down through time. So this morning we'll have the um, uh, the opening of this week uh, of uh, celebration um, with uh, uh, this uh, ritual of of uh, jodoe of attaining to the way assembly of attaining to the way it's fairly simple I'll leave here in a minute and um, change my robes and have a typical entrance and then um, there'll be some special offerings that are made and then the whole assembly will come forward and um, and offer incense individually um, and then after that's done we'll all make nine prostrations together that are signaled on the large bell and then there'll be a proclamation about um, the this assembly and why it's important, and there'll be some sutra chanting, the Makahanya Haramita Shingyo, and the Shosai Myo Kichijo Dharani, which um, I, I, there'll be some, there's some papers or something that will go out, um, and then uh, dedication of merit, uh, finish it off. So, pretty much like most of the ceremonies you've been to, um, it will be like that. But I, I would invite you that um, these rituals, uh, they carry something in very important. Um, the legends, the mythology lives as we enact the assemblies of those uh, legends. So a ritual is not just uh, something that's divorced from the legend. It is the way we live the legend out through our own lives. And so um, they're designed to be meditative, but not meditative in the sense that we just concentrate and everything goes away, but meditative, meditative in the sense that the... Um, the truth of that legend is enacted through what we're doing together. So if you just uh, treat it a little bit like Zazen, um, but a Zazen in which you're at, you do things throughout um, that period, then I think you will find uh, there is uh, a lot to learn uh, in, the, in the ritual itself. sun forever rising in the east. Branches and roots collect the bright sky, the dark earth. At the center of the wheel, gate of upright sitting, not a single thing apart from this. <laughs> Blades are celestial flowers, hot ash, sandalwood powder. Here we join you in touching the ground.
on the fifth day of this month, we respectfully celebrate the occasion of the attainment of the way by great benefactor and founder of the doctrine, the original teacher Shakyamuni Buddha. We have reverently prepared incense, flowers, candles, sweets, and tea, and have extended them an offering. We offer the excellent merit of the gathering of this present pure assembly to requite the compassionate blessings of the Buddha's Dharma milk. The following is humbly considered. When pitchers, plates, hairpins, and bracelets are melted together, they become as one metal. Were it not for the fire of wisdom, this would scarcely be possible. When guitar, zither, lute, and harp are tuned together, the six dominant tones can be harmonized. But without clever fingers, how could this ever be accomplished? It is true that all living beings are fully equipped with the wisdom and virtue of the Tathagata. But if the Great Awakened One did not have the expedient means to reveal the delusion and awakening of living beings, Enya's madness would be difficult to stop, and the jewel on the strong man's forehead would be long forgotten. We now know of the attainment of the way by the great earth and sentient beings and are freshly aware of the direct cause of inherent Buddha nature. May the illumination of wisdom long shine and may the flame of a single lamp be transmitted to hundreds and thousands of lamps. May the wind of the way blow endlessly in this world and reach to limitless realms. Humbly stated. Sha
Hanya Haranita Shinyo and the Shosai Myo Kichijo Dorani, we offer the merit to great benefactor and founder of the doctrine, the original teacher, Shakyamuni Buddha, who entered into the way on this day. May we repay his compassionate blessing. Hey, hey.